I care about prayer. And that, that's kind of been where we have been and our focus. And I make sure we get this jewel on. But I care about prayer. You know, prayer sets the stage for a lot. We have opening prayer. We got a closing prayer. We got prayer for the Lord's Supper. We got bread. We got juice. We got giving. We have prayer. Prayer is important. Let me ask you a question. How many of you, not in the corporate setting of being at church, how many of you have prayed this morning? Oh, right there. Hey, good. Some of us may rise in the morning and we start our day with prayer. Hallelujah. Some of us may go to bed at nine before we put it, put head to pillow. We may pray. And as I grew up, every meal, every meal had prayer, no matter where we were, what we were doing, it was part of it. Every moment, and I'm going to get to one of those moments in just a moment, life was bathed in prayer. I was fortunate. Yeah, I grew up and I played sports, and I had a peewee coach, and, man, we prayed all the time. And he would say, smile, God loves you. He would pray with us. I had a junior college baseball coach. And, hey, we prayed on the bus. We prayed at the game. We prayed in the dugout. Praise the Lord for somebody who's got prayer was that important. And even in that type of setting, because you don't see that too often. I have verification that this morning after the 8 o'clock service, I'm standing out there, and I had two people who were visiting here. They came to watch their grandson play ball because they come to the 8 o'clock and they were going to the game. And they're from where I'm from, out in the sticks where they pump the sunlight in. And they said, I rem they remembered the people I was talking about. They remembered the places I was talking about. And one of those places is simply this. When I was growing up, we'd go over to Walter Floyd's house, and we would be sure that he got all his wood for the winter, and we'd go behind his house to a place called Rock Bottom. And it had rocks down there in the bottom, so thus the name Rock Bottom. And we would all meet over there. I bet it was 40 or 50 of us because he had eight kids and grandchildren and cousins and nephews. But we would make sure that Uncle Floyd had plenty of wood for the winter, and I'll never forget, before the first chainsaw was cranked up, we would gather in the woods and pray. Now, how many people you know gather in the woods to pray before we go cut wood? I just want you to think about that. Another time I remember we were about to have supper, my daddy said the blessing, and during the blessing, the ketchup top popped off, went straight to the ceiling. I'll never forget it. So we understand that praying is important. Why do you pray? Man, prayer, it, man, it makes me feel better. Helps me feel closer to God. Hey, now I don't have sermon notes. Get your phone out. Take a picture. Here they come. It helps me understand I need God. Gives me strength and hope. Helps to guide my way. Grows my faith. I can ask for forgiveness. It allows me to say, thank you, Lord. It allows me to ask for help. I want to go through a few of these. We're going to the top and we're coming down. Stay with me. Here we go. I think about feeling better. I need a, a sense of connection. Do you know that this conversation with God, it will reduce stress? There's going to be some physical attributes that I tell you about prayer. It impacts the immune system. But I'm going to tell you something. How many of you understand what I'm talking about? Oh, I feel better. I needed that prayer. I know when people come down front and ask for forgiveness or encouragement, it makes them feel better. Now, Dave's in Greece, and Dave's going to travel back. We're going to pray for Dave's safety. My daughter is in Ecuador. I can't run and do anything for her, but I can pray for her safety. I, can, I took a picture last night on Life 360, and it showed Ecuador, where she was, and I took her picture on her. I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. I said, look where she is, and it says equator. I said, she's at the equator. But I can't. I can't go do anything specific for Dave right now. I can't do anything specific for Macy, but I can pray. And do you believe that prayer is important? Amen. Do you believe that prayer is powerful? Amen. I know I do. The second one, how it helps me feel closer. Well, when I talk to anybody, my relationship grows. When I talk to God, I spend time with him. That relationship is going to grow just like church. Hey, bring him to VBS. Hey, bring him to Bible study. Hey, bring him to class. You're going to partner with each other because God is alive. He wants to work in you. He wants to work through you. He wants to be a part of it. Helps me understand how much I need God. I think praying reminds us sometimes how feeble we might be. It ain't about me. It's how you say, people say, God's got this. God's got this. You've heard people make that statement, and I hate it. Let me tell you something. When I pray, God, it's not about me. I need you. I need you, O oh Lord. It helps me understand how much I need God. How about strength and hope? 
I'm going to give you this one. This is the anxiety removal. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Be anxious for nothing, no worries, no fear, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Don't hold it back. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, it'll guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. I'm searching for strength. I'm searching for hope. It helps to guide my way. God, give me the guidance. I, I, what am I supposed to do? Where am I supposed to go? What am I supposed to say? Help me to make wise choices. Help me to be closer to you, Lord. It grows my faith. Are you making prayer a priority? They say, and I say, communication is the key to cohesiveness. If I'm working to hey, a company, a team, it doesn't matter. If we're not talking, if we're not communicating, we're not going to be very good, are we? I need to talk to God. We need to talk to God. I, I think about how that helps to grow my faith, grow your faith. Asking for forgiveness. It shows repentance, shows obedience. They say it will physically lower your blood pressure. It will slow your heart rate. I believe that. I believe it because I'm not a doctor and I'm not a scientist, but I can read and I see it and I believe it and I know it's there. It helps with depression. It gives you confidence. Take it to the Lord in prayer. We'll be there in a moment. It allows me to say thank you. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. God is at work helping me with my life, and he's helping me with my circumstances. And the last one there, it allows me to ask for help. Here's this group of believers in this body of Christ, and hey, it's powerful because they want to pray with you and pray for you. Can you think of a time when prayer has carried you? Who's with me? Hey, and I don't want to discount prayer. I think prayer is powerful. There's some people in this building, that's all they can do is pray. I may be a physical age where, well, you know, I wish I could go be hands and feet, but I can pray, and I'm going to tell you something, that's powerful. People say, I want you to know I'm praying for you. Hey, I'm guilty, left my phone down there, but I'm as guilty as anybody. I'll send you a text, and I'll put them prayer hands on there. I'll put them prayer hands in a little heart, it means I love you, I'm praying for you. And somebody go, are you really praying for me? Did you just send that text? Do you really mean it? And I want you to think about that for just a moment. I'm praying for you. I care about you. I love you. God loves you. We, we need help. I want you to know I'm praying for you. Letting people know, I've been there before. What can we do for you? Can you pray for us? Absolutely. Do it. Do it. We're going to take it a little further in just a moment. But I want you to know that prayer is powerful. We sing the song, and I'd ask for you to sing it, and that's fine. What a friend we have in Jesus. As, as we look at these lyrics, and then let's go for them, we know them, and I think there's very much power in the lyrics itself. I'm going to talk about why it was written, you may know. All our sins and griefs to bear, we can ask for forgiveness, no doubt. Hey, what a privilege to carry. What are we going to do? Everything to God in prayer, everything. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. You know why? Because we don't take it to God in prayer. Need pain, we're in pain, you don't need to. Take it to God. All because we don't carry everything to God in prayer. We got trials, we got temptations, we got troubles. Don't be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful? When I and you hear about this, well, I, I've read this before, and many of you know it. A lot of times when you know songs and why they're written, I want you to hear this. Can we find a friend so faithful? Who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy late? Come with a load of care. Precious Savior, still our refuge. Where do I go for safety? Where do I go for hope? Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise, forsake thee. Take it to the Lord in prayer. You count on Jesus. You count on God. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou will find a solace there. Boom. Let's go back and let's listen. Are you ready? Dwight L. Moody Incorporate the song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, in his sermons, his writings, his teachings. Caused many people to believe that this song is an American hymn. Not so was written by a transplanted Irishman in Canada. Joseph Scribble, he had wealth, education, a devoted family, a pleasant life in his native country of Ireland. Son of a captain in the British Royal Marines, Joseph was born in Ireland in 1819. Received his university degree from Trinity College in London. Enrolled in military college to prepare for an army career. Poor health forced him to give up that ambition. He quickly established himself as a teacher. He fell in love. 
made plans to settle in his hometown. The unexpected happened. On the night before Scriven's scheduled wedding, his fiance drowned. What a sad story. In his deep sorrow, he realized that he could only find the solace and support in his dearest friend, Jesus. Shortly thereafter, Scriven left Ireland to start a new life in Canada. He established a home in Port Hope where he met and fell in love with Eliza Rice. Weeks before she was to become Joseph Scriven's bride, she suddenly grew sick. When a matter of weeks, Eliza Scriven, his second fiance, died. A shattered Scriven turned to the only thing that had anchored him during his life, his faith. Through prayer and Bible study, he found not just solace, but a mission. The 25-year-old Scriven dramatically changed his lifestyle. He took a vow of poverty, sold his earthly possessions, vowed to give his life to the physically handicapped and the financially destitute. Often he would give away his clothes and his possessions to those in need. He worked without pay for anyone who needed him. He became known as the Good Samaritan of Port Hope. Stories told that two businessmen stood on a Port Hope, Ontario street corner as a little man carried a saw along by. One of the businessmen said, there is a man who is happy with his lot in life. I wish I could know his joy. Perhaps I could get him to cut my winter supply of wood. The other businessman replied, I know that man. He would not cut your firewood. He cuts only for the financially destitute and for those who are physically handicapped and cannot cut their own wood. Ten years after Eliza died, Scriven received word that his mother had become very ill. Because of his vow of poverty, Joseph did not have the money to go home and help care for her. Heart sick and feeling a need to reach out, he wrote a comforting letter, enclosing the words of his newly written poem with the prayer that these brief lines would remind her of a never-failing friend that she had in Jesus. Sometimes later, when Scriven himself became ill, a friend came to call upon him and see a copy of the words scribbled on a scratched piece of paper near his bed. And after reading the words, the friend said, Who wrote these beautiful words? I love his reply. The Lord and I did it between us. Do you think he was praying to God? Do you think his prayer was powerful in his conversation with God and his studying God's Word and his relying upon God? Joseph Scriven eventually drowned in a Canadian lake in 1886. He did not live to see his song carried to every corner of the globe, nor could he ever imagine that it would be, we'd be talking about him and those words scribbled today. What a powerful song. Now you know the story of it. Now you know why his life was built upon doing the things that he did and how he did it. Have you considered the phrase, I'm praying for you, is not all God has called us to do? What do you think? Shake your head this way, that way, and here's where I want to get to. I'm not saying, hey, your prayers are needed, and sometimes that's all we can do. Sometimes that may be all you can do. We will not discount them. We will take them. Hey, I tell you what, just pray this prayer and you'll be saved. Did God tell us to do that? Nope. There's more to it than that. There's got to be more to it because here's what God's told us to do. How about sick? I'm sick. Well, let's just pray about it. Don't go to the doctor, Brian. Don't change your diet. Brian, you want to lose 100 pounds? Well, I tell you what do. You pray about it and you go eat nine Big Macs. It ain't going to work. You've got to do something. You've got to act. And I think we know, if you think about for just a moment, there's so many things that we pray for and pray about, but it's not all God has called us to do. I got to do my part. I got to be faithful. There was a young man years ago that I coached, and he had a, a, a tremendous car wreck. It was awful. And, you know, I'm not a doctor, and I'm not a, a nurse, and I don't know how to do any of those things. And it was, he was hooked to a machine at the med, and I grabbed a hold of him, and I grabbed his hand, and we grabbed mom and dad, and we began to pray. And I'll never forget that nurse in there said, he's responding. He's responding. And all I could do was pray. There's power in prayer. I could feel him squeeze my hand. I could feel him squeeze all there. And I, and I want you to just think for just a moment of how, what can I do besides pray? Is there more than I can do than just pray? You know, we... we we bow our heads in prayer, right? Yeah, hey, how many of you have gotten on your knees to pray? Gotten down on your knees. How many of you have, have hey, we, we clap, and I got this great picture of this guy. He's got hands clapped, head bowed, he's on his knees, and I saw that and thought it was a cool picture. 
Uh, I, hey, what about lifting hands up to the sky? I, I think about that. How many of you have ever been mad at God and talking to him? You ever been mad at God and praying to him? You ever been upset, having, having emotions and feelings? Abraham fell on his face before God. Moses prayed with his hands outstretched. King Solomon, he knelt. Jesus prayed looking up to heaven. I'll never forget Thyatira, Mississippi. And those people that were here, they knew where Rock Bottom was and knew what Thyatira is. But Thyatira, they're having a gospel meeting. And this gentleman got up and said, I want you to do something. I want all. He just asked the men. He could have asked the, He said, I want all the men. We're going to pray for this meeting. We're going to pray for souls to be touched. He said, I want you to get out on your knees. We're going to pray. And I'll never forget, okay, is this something of show? Is this something to be showy? But I'll never forget a lady. She said, I'll never forget because there were many of those elders, one being my papa. Is it difficult for you to get out of a pew and get on your knee? That's difficult. And she said, I'll never forget seeing some of those men get down on their knees to pray. She goes, it left an impact upon my life. She said, it changed the way I thought about prayer. It changed uh, many of the things that as she looked at them and saying, what are we doing? Now, when I say that, I'm going to tell you what I don't agree with. And I'm not discounted because I got news for you. If you're praying, then you are trying to talk to God. And that's between you and him. But I watch football games and games, and y'all see how they, right before the kickoff, and it's on television, when well, we're going to run down there to the end zone, what are we going to do? Let's all get down here for a minute. We're going to get on our knee. We're going to let all the world see us pray. Maybe those prayers are as pertinent and as they're genuine, and I hope they are. But a lot of people, do they pray for show? Maybe so. I let God be the judge. But what is the power in my prayer for me individually? And what's the power for the people or the persons that I'm praying for? And then what's my language and what's my attitude toward God? And, and how I, that's why I think of that sometimes I watch people and they, they pray, but then they go play the game a certain way or they talk a certain way or they live a certain way. And I go, I don't know how pleased God is with it. You know what I mean? Prayer in motion. Faith into action. When you talk to God, I pray it prompts us to do something about the situation. Are you with me? Maybe all I can do is pray. If that's all I can do, we'll do it. God, please help me to find a way to help this individual. What can I do? Help me to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Help me to be salt and light because I think there's more than we can do. I want you to turn to the book of James, please. I'll ask you to go to two places today, and that's it. James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. Faith without works is dead. Faith comes alive. Prayer must come alive as well. I can pray that God will take care of it, sure, but how can we step into the needs of the people? What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith only save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, I ain't got nothing to eat. Well, just pray for it. It'll just pop out there. Nope, I got to feed them. I've got to find a way to help them get some sustenance. What is it that they need? And if one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Not a whole lot of good, does it? Sometimes we just talk about word of mouth, just talk it, just say it. These sprinkler systems you see up here, it just makes me go there. I used to put in sprinkler systems, and my, my, my cousins, we, we would stand there sometimes, and one time I, I got there, and they were just looking up. And I said, what are we doing? He said, we're looking this pipe up. You can't look pipe up. You got to put the pipe on the lift, go up there, take a 32-inch pipe wrench, and you got to put the pipe up. Well, I'm just going to hope it happens. I'm just going to focus real hard. I'm going to put my... A&P book under my pillow and that's going to help me solve that equation on the test or that's going to help me study for this exam. No, I, I got to put the work in. I've got to do something. My faith has to take part of what the works is that needs to be done. Thus also by faith itself, it do, if it does not have works, it's what? It's dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe there's one God, you do well. Even the demons believe it, tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar? He went through the actual process. He had the knife. He was about to take Isaac's life. He was going to do what was asked of him. Do you not see that faith was working together with his works and by 
works, faith was made perfect, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not just faith. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? She did something. Was there something for her to do? Just pray about it, Rahab. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith with works is dead also. There's something I can do. Hey, you like that? We're going to follow the prayer with I care. It's our theme. I care. What can you do? Brother Jerry, those uh, weeds out there, they just, let's just go pray that weeds out that garden, right? We're going to pray that grant. This week he was describing for me, I was videoing, I was talking about the garden. He said, we got this many rows of beans and this many rows of crabgrass. It's like we planned it out there like that. But it's not, no, I got you, well, let's have a potluck supper, but don't nobody bring nothing. We'll just pray about it. Ain't nothing coming. Ain't no egg olive sandwiches back there. Unless somebody makes it. Unless somebody does some work. Unless somebody does something. We're going to follow it up. I so appreciate your prayers. I thank you for your prayers. What can we do? Just for, We hear that. Hey, just pray for us. That's good. I'm not discounting. But what more can we do? Is there more? Is there a need that I can feed? Is there something that we can do? Maybe it's a physical action that we got to take place with. Our faith has to come alive. Care is where prayer takes motion. I care. I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to pray for you. But then I'm going to put it to work. There's something for me to do. There's some action that I can take place. Now I want you to turn to Luke chapter 10, please. Let me hear them pages turn. Luke chapter 10, and this is where our reading came from, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Everybody knows the story. Let's walk through this together now. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him. We won't even read that again because we read it once, but we do want to read this part. I understand that I'm supposed to love God, all my heart, all my soul, all my strength, all my mind, and your neighbor. You've answered rightly. Do this and you'll live. In verse 29, where we ended, said, Who's my neighbor? Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, no clothes, wounded him, hurt him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road. Oh, priest, come. we're good, we're golden, we are saved. Here comes a priest. priest a priest is going to do something, right? Hey, now what does it say that the priest did? A certain priest came down. Now, he didn't slow down in the car. He didn't rubberneck. I'm going to pray for you. Maybe, hey, surely the priest prayed, right? Surely he said a prayer. Hope he'd be all right. Hope he'd be taken. He just, but he went on by. That's all he did. Now, I want you to think about you and where you are and the people in your life that may have a need they may have something that, that, that could help them. And what are you doing with that opportunity? Likewise, verse 32, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, now he says he arrived. That, that sounds like he pulled off the side of the road, right? Came and looked. Well, if he looked, he didn't pass by. He passed by on the other side. What we got? Who is that? Mm -mm. I'll pray for you, though. I'm going to pray for you. Maybe he prayed, too. And I know we're just thinking out loud here. Maybe he prayed. Let's move on. But a certain Samaritan, as he sojourned, came where he was. And when he saw him, what did he have? Compassion. So he went to him. I want you to think about when he gets to this individual. And I want you to go back up to verse 30. Fell among the thieves stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, left him half dead. So when he saw him, he had compassion. Verse 34, so he went to him and he bandaged his wounds, putting on, pouring on oil and wine. He set him on his animal. That means he had to walk. Brought him to an inn, took him somewhere, 
and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, listen, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? Because Jesus tried to explain to him, who's your neighbor? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Okay. So what do I need to be doing for the individuals in my life and for the people at my church and for the people I work with? How can I do more than just pray? Do y'all remember when the tornadoes came through and it came through Rolling Fort, Mississippi, and it killed some people down there, and then it was traveling? Do y'all remember when it went to Amory, Mississippi? Do you remember that? Do you remember the weatherman in Tupelo? Do you remember the story? Here it comes. I'll give you just a, a, a couple of hits from it here. Chief Meteorologist Matt Lobin, he was telling this story, and he was recognizing how God used his prayer in powerful waves. Um, he described in the article from the Storm Prediction Center, and, he, and you know, y'all been there before, that noise comes up, tornado warning. I ain't worried about that tornado. Well, tornado warning means what? We've seen it. It has been spotted. Take cover. I'm supposed to do something. Oh, don't do nothing. Just keep on doing what you're doing. It just might come your way. Hey, they've got it down now. Here comes the path. It's coming here. It's coming this street. It's coming here. It's coming here. Well, this weatherman's got some know-how. He's got some brains. He's got some intellect. He understands the screens, and he understands what's going on. He's also seen what's taking place in Rolling Fork, and he's got the words coming in. There's been some people that have lost their lives. How can I make people listen to my words and know that they need to take cover? What can they do? He said, I've tracked hundreds of tornadoes, almost never facing the level of stress that I faced that night with warning signs from paper playing out in real time. I felt prompted to pray on the air, and he prayed. And it, was very, it, wasn't, it, very, it wasn't a lengthy prayer. It wasn't a lengthy prayer at all. It was very, very short. He says, I tell my kids, you don't have to think about being like the Pharisee with this long, elaborate prayer. If you got something to say, God will understand it. I think about that long prayer. Do y'all remember back Sunday, Monday, happy days, Tuesday, Wednesday. Hey, remember Fonzie? The Fonz, leather jacket, so cool. He's over at the Cunninghams, and I think it's Thanksgiving. And Mr. C asked Fonzie to say the blessing. Fonzie didn't know how to say the blessing. You know what Fonzie said? Does anybody remember? Fonzie, if you go, you got to go watch it, go to YouTube it, you can see it. Fonzie sits there, and of course, everybody's, you know, their heads are bowed. Maybe they were holding hands at the Cunningham house. Fonzie looks up and says, God, thanks. That's all he said. That's all he knew. I bet you God heard it. Well, the thing about this weatherman's prayer is that people, when he prayed on the air, that was something different. That was something unique. Never seen a weatherman do that on TV. People took cover. Anybody want to tell me how many people lost their lives in Amory, Mississippi? Zero. Zero. People took action because of his prayer. He said, I never intended. I just knew there was a need. I knew there was a danger. And I wanted people to pay attention to what they need to pay attention to. There's power in prayer. Just like us when there's something that takes place, you know, a storm or whatever, we've had Waverly, we've had even the tornadoes, water shows up, water bottles. People need clean water to drink. All right, let's just pray for them. No, we're going to take water to them. Food, chainsaws, just like that garden. It ain't going to happen overnight. Somebody's got to do some work. Somebody's got to get in there and actually put hand to it. Prayer in motion. When you step into the tragedy, or the need, the feed, be the church. This is Jason Speed. I think of him every time when I hear that. He'll send a text for reflections, and they do a lot of different things. Be the church. We have an opportunity to be the church. And then somebody made this statement along his line, we're doing church. Now, we're doing church. We're to worship God. We're going to sing. We're going to pray. We're going to take the Lord's Supper. We're, but it doesn't stop here. 
I get to be the church. I get to pray for people. I get to act upon that prayer. And there, there's something that I can do. There's something that I can act upon. What a great theme. I care. I like it. I like it. I know when, when Dave talks about it, I mean, it, it's easier to take a broad picture spectrum of what you're trying to do is, is coming up with lessons and things of that nature. It, it makes it where it, I don't know, there's so many different things you can think about. Well, I got news for you. Well, we are commanded to pray. And then I want you to think about for just a moment as you pray, think about the things that you pray about and the energy in which you pray. And maybe it's just mundane daily things. I can think about my daddy sitting there at the table and praying for the breakfast or the lunch or the supper or what have you. Mundane, but somebody starving, that prayer means a little more. You go to somebody's house and the tornado has wiped their everything about their life away and you brought them water and you brought them clothes and you got your arms around them and we say, we love you, we care about you, what more do you need, we're going to pray for you. You have come to my rescue. God wants to rescue us from trouble in our life, from pain, from sorrow. He wants us to take it to the Lord in prayer. And I want to encourage you to act upon your prayers. I want to encourage you to act upon what can I do more so than just pray. This morning, you may need prayers. We can give you that. This morning, you may want to put Christ on in baptism, become a member of the Lord's church. You can be raised to walk a new life, and hallelujah, we can do that.